so just to give you guys a, a, a little bit of background on what's going to go on in the next 14 PATH lectures, basically we go through the BCSC book. Um, today you get a little bit of a reprieve because today it's just going to be an introduction to PATH. And so we don't, you know, have a whole lot in the BCS book on introduction, so you get a reprieve. But next Tuesday we're doing LID. And you're responsible for everything in the BCS LID section prior to the, the lecture. We'll expand upon it. And the way I like to do it is I like to ask you guys to tell me what's on the slide, not vice versa. Okay, so we just go around the room and you guys can kind of tell us what you're seeing and, you know, expand upon it a little bit. The other thing that I get to do is you are a captive audience and so as a result, I get to show you my travel slides. And so usually the slides will be the place where the ESCRS was most recently. And so the ESCRS was in Vienna this year. So during the next several weeks, we get to go to Vienna, okay? So this is the old cathedral. They've been kind of renovating it for, I mean, since I first went there eight years ago. So it's one of those constant renovation ones. But this is the, the old cathedral. It's very weird because it's got this bizarre Art Deco roof to it, which doesn't quite fit a medieval cathedral. It's very, very strange. But in any event, this is the big cathedral in the middle of, of Vienna. Vienna has this huge um, pedestrian mall that you, that you kind of walk up, and it's got shops and restaurants and places to get, you know, coffee and beer in the middle. So um, this is kind of the, the center of the old city. And here again, you can see they've really done a nice job of um, cleaning up the towers here, and then they're working now on the sides of this. And so hopefully the next time I go there in another 10 years, it will be um, completely renovated. And of course, there's statues everywhere. And, um, you know, this isn't one of the old statues. So what we're going to do is, as we go from lecture to lecture, you guys will get a little tour of Vienna. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right, so eyes. Now, we can't know and understand eye pathology until we understand embryology. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about embryology. And what's interesting is you look at a mouse embryo at the same stages of development as a human embryo, and they look very much the same. And so you really don't see a whole lot of differences. And so a lot of the studies that have been done on embryos have been on, on things like mouse embryos. And so we're going we're gonna to go ahead and we're going to go through this a little bit. And this is the, the very early stage, but it's very similar to the way that the human um, you know, embryo develops. And what you see is you'll initially see the outpouching of the optic vesicle. And, um, okay, Chris, what is the, um, what layer of the um, embryological uh, tissue does the optic vesicle come from? Uh, neuroectoderm. Neuroectoderm, very good. So, again, now we're going to practice answers here for oral boards. And so, two things that you don't want to do if you ever want to get credit for answering a question, don't go, uh. <laughs> and then don't let your voice come up. So don't go, neuroactoderm, because then the attending thinks you're guessing. You'll get no credit for it, even if you get it right. So no matter if you're right or wrong, say it with conviction. Neuroactoderm. And so then if you got it right, great. If you got it wrong, you, you still get partial credit. So basically when the embryo forms the eye, you have an outpouching from the neuroectoderm, which comes out toward the side. It's called the optic vesicle. And in schematic form on top, and then in actual cells, again, from mouse embryos on the bottom, you can see that the optic vesicle pouches out. It's a neuroectoderm. And then it approaches the surface. So Rachel, what is the surface? What layer is the surface made of? Ectoderm. Surface ectoderm, all right. So as this neuroectoderm pouches out, it hits the surface ectoderm. The surface ectoderm will thicken and then you'll get an in-pouching. And so you'll see you'll get this starting to go in, almost like you've got a balloon that comes out, and it's a soft balloon, and then you put your fist in it. And so what you see is you see that this neuroectoderm will invaginate, and surface ectoderm will invaginate also, and then eventually the surface ectoderm will pinch off and will form the primitive lens, the neuroectoderm will go into two layers, and those two layers will form 
other structures of the eye that we're going to talk about, okay? You can see it again in the mouse embryos. We're looking down here. So the surface ectoderm is here. It thickens. It will begin to invaginate, and so you're left with a bilayer neuroectoderm. The surface ectoderm will pinch off and will form the crystalline lens. All right, so when you look at what the neuroectoderm does, the neuroectoderm, once it invaginates in, it's got two layers. So, Vaish, what do those two layers end up forming? The, um, the epithelium of the ciliary body as well as the retina. Okay, and what else besides ciliary body? Iris. Also, so the iris pigmented epithelium, the ciliary body epithelium, both pigmented and non-pigmented, and then the RPE and the retina all come from, from the neuroectoderm. So if you look at it, as you go further back, the RPE is that outer layer. The entire retina comes from the inner layer. And so all of that inner layer um, you know, comes, from that, comes from that single layer. So the retina, all the layers of the retina that you think about come from that inner layer of neuroectoderm. Okay. All right, now, how does the blood supply get to the you know, developing eye? And, and that's an important thing that we need to look at. And so what you've got right here is you get a little fissure that is inferior, a little bit inferior nasal. And in that fissure will travel the hyaloid artery. And so the hyaloid artery will go into that fissure, and eventually the hyaloid artery will um, go ahead and, and give blood supply to that inside of the eye as it is developing. And so when you look at this, you can see that it'll come in through this little fissure, and then eventually that fissure will close. So I'm going to show you a couple things that happens when that choroidal fissure doesn't close. So what are we looking at right here as we go across the iris all right, so this is an iris coloboma, and you notice that it's inferior. So when that choroidal fissure, where the hyaluronic artery comes in, closes, it first closes about at the equator, and then it runs anterior and posterior. So if you're going to get a failure of closure, you're going to get a coloboma, and so most commonly the colobomas are either anterior or posterior. They're not usually in the middle, because that's where it begins to close off. And so you see an iris coloboma here inferiorly, and that is a sign that that choroidal fissure did not completely close off anteriorly. If you look posteriorly, what do we get? What do we get here? So this is a optic nerve coloboma. All right. So you can see posteriorly, and again, it's inferior where that fissure was. So here's the optic nerve, and you're just looking at bare sclera here. So it didn't close off completely, and so you didn't get retina to form, you didn't get RPE to form, and so posteriorly you see an optic nerve coloboma. And those are the two areas where that choroidal fissure just doesn't form. All right, so we talked a little bit about how the lens forms. And the lens, again, comes from the surface ectoderm. And so the surface ectoderm will invaginate, it'll pinch off, and you'll get this little round cyst. Now, these fibers posteriorly will start to grow, and they'll grow anteriorly and they'll fill that vesicle completely until it becomes solid. And that's your embryologic nucleus of the eye. Now, after that, from then on, you do not normally have lens epithelial cells posteriorly. They'll go to the equator, and then they'll send fibers anteriorly and posteriorly throughout life. And so your lens will become bigger, it'll become more oblong-shaped, it'll become denser but you normally do not have lens epithelial cells along the back surface of the crystalline lens. And this just shows a little bit how these fibers come. They come from anteriorly to the equator and then they fan out along the equator and they send fibers anteriorly and posteriorly. And here it is on this EM. The fibers going anteriorly and posteriorly, but you do not normally have lens epithelial cells posteriorly after those first you know, eight weeks of, of the embryo developing. Here you see it in the mouse eye, again, uh, very similar to human eye. Again, embryos look, look very similar when you're looking at this stage. Let's go back one. And here you could actually see it in the eye. Now, here is that hyaloid artery, and that hyaloid artery will provide vessels 
to the forming lens, but also to the iris and to the anterior segment of the eye. And so as that hyaluronic artery you know, helps that developing eye go, eventually that hyaluronic artery will regress and it will go down normally. However, there are times when the hyaluronic artery doesn't go down. What do we see in here? Non-regressed hyaloid artery. Yeah, it's actually called, it's just called a persistent hyaloid artery. And you can see this not uncommonly. Every once in a while you'll be looking in, you know, with your 90 and you'll look in and you'll say, what is that funny line right there? And as you look, you'll see here's the tunica vasculosa lentis, which, you know, should eventually go away. And here's that hyaloid artery coming all the way back and inserting into the optic nerve. So. Sometimes you do not get complete regression of that hyaluronic artery, and you'll have remnants, both anteriorly and posteriorly, once again. So here you see, this is an eye, this is about 25 weeks gestation, and this just shows you, here's your tunica vasculosa lentis, here's your lens, and behind it here is this little vascular network. It's like a net of vessels all around. All right, now, we want to talk a little bit about just pathology in general. And again, this is just an intro lecture. And so I want to talk about some of the cells that we want to look at and some of the inflammatory processes that we have to deal with. So this is a fake slide. I mean, I copied it. You don't get a slide that's got every single white blood cell on it. But I thought it was a cool slide. This has been passed down for probably 40 years. But it's got kind of a picture of all the different types of blood cells on a single slide. So. Let's just keep going around. What is this cell right here? It's like a, a PMN. PMN, and what does that stand for? Polymorphic nucleus. Polymorphic neutrophil. So you've got multiple nuclei in here. You've got all these little secretory granules in here. So that's a PMN. All right, what's that one? Not sure. That is an eosinophil. And eosinophils are um, pink. They're eosinophilic staining, and they'll often have a bilobed, heart-shaped nucleus. And you've got all these little eosinophilic granules. So by the way, I just ask questions of everybody. So if you're just here, that's okay. You don't, you know, you don't have points taken off. <laughs> all right, so that's an eosinophil. All right, now we're going to look at a different type. What is this thing? We'll just keep going around. So that one was pink, eosinophil. This is blue. That's a basophil. All right, so it's a basophil. And you can see that it's got blue granules all over the place. All right, what is this? Monocyte. More specific? Plasmacell. Not quite. More a lymphocyte. Yeah, but still, same idea. So it's a mononuclear cell, it's a lymphocyte. Right, what are these things? Believe it or not, those are platelets. And then here we've got, of course, red blood cells, which kind of give you an idea of the sizing of these various white cells. All right, so let's talk a little bit about each one. So PMNs, okay? Again, that polymorphone neutrophil, it can have anywhere from three to four, even up to seven little nuclear fragments. What does a PMN do? Uh, so it's, uh, it secretes granules. Uh, it's kind of involved in our first line immune system. Exactly. So it's kind of the first line defense that you have. And so each of these secretory granules has collagenases in it. It's got proteinases in it. I mean, this is the real defender. And so when you have an insult, these are the ones that go in. They release these granules. These granules help to, you know, kill whatever invading pathogen is there. They help to eat up whatever's there. Now, this is good because it helps your body defend it. Now, if you're in a cornea, you know, your clear cornea stroma, this is bad because you don't want, you know, all this stuff being dumped out into your cornea. And so, you know, again, it's a double-edged sword when you're looking at your, your inflammation. So PMNs are kind of your frontline um, inflammatory mediator cells. All right, what do we eosinophils do? So I think they have a couple of functions. They also have uh, granules and they're um, associated with, um, like, fighting hemanthic infections, but okay. also, I think, response to antigens that are presented to it. 
Exactly. So a couple of different things. If, if you see parasites that are inside the eye, you'll often see these eosinophils associated with them, but they're often involved in our allergic reaction. And a lot of the granules they release have things like histamines and other things in them. So they can be involved in allergic type of reactions. So again, um, you know, the immune system is always a balance. You want them to be acting to protect you, but you want them to shut off before the actual inflammatory reaction causes more damage or causes more symptoms and more problems. And this just shows you, boy, that's a bad picture of eosinophils. Sorry about that. All right, so what do lymphocytes do? So they're involved in viral infections, more chronic infections when you have your T or B cells, and um, Ts do antigen presentation and B cells make antibodies. Okay, so they're more chronic inflammation. So when you see these mononuclear inflammatory cells, they're more chronic inflammation, and again, viral, sometimes viral. And so this is a lymphocyte. When you look at the lymphocyte, the nucleus takes up about 90% of the cell body, and then the cytoplasm is just that little sliver around it. But in addition to, you know, just standard lymphocytes, you have plasma cells in, in trop. What do plasma cells do? All right, so they're basically an antibody factory, if you look at them. And so when you look at, at plasma cells, the nucleus will be eccentric. So it'll be pushed to the side, and then you see the cytoplasm here. You often have what we call a wagon wheel clumping. It looks like one of those, you know, wagon wheels that you see on the, you know, wagons that the pioneers brought across the prairies. And so here you see the wagon wheel clumping, and then you'll even see a little area here where it's kind of clear, and that's where all the Golgi apparatuses sit, and that's where the antibodies are made. And so these, if you think about it, are almost an antibody factory and they come from the B lymphocytes and then eventually will transform into the, into the plasma cells. Now, eventually when you have a really chronic inflammation going on, these cells that are making all of these antibodies can eventually <clears throat> almost overproduce and it ends up spitting the nucleus out and just leaving you with a big sack of antibodies. And so these are called Russell bodies. So that's a sign of chronicity of, of an inflammation. Okay, now, Monocytes. What do monocytes do and why are they important? So they're another cell that's involved in kind of chronic inflammation. Um, and when they go into the tissue, they might turn into a macrophage. And that's what's important. So the monocytes, as they leave the blood vessel and go into the tissue, transform into macrophages. And once they're in the tissue as, as macrophages, or if you want to sound intelligent, say something with a British accent. So you say, macrophages, and, and so that makes you sound more intelligent. So, macrophages, so, um, and I couldn't do a lecture without insulting somebody, so if you, any of you guys are from the South, you know, I get to insult you, so no matter what you say with a British accent, it sounds intelligent. No matter how smart you are, if you put a y'all in there, it just don't sound smart, you know, so, or if you're from Wyoming, you know, it's really hard to sound smart, so, but if you want to sound intelligent and you want to, people think, well, wow, that guy's really smart, say it with a British accent. So say macrophages. And then it sounds very intelligent. So what do they do? Um, so their main role is actually for presenting antigens to um, uh, different, other different white blood cells. Exactly. So they kind of gather these different antigens and present it, but they've also got another function. They're kind of the the garbage man, you know, of the immune system. And so whenever you have an insult, they're the ones who kind of clean up, you know, clean up the damage that's being done too. And so they do have kind of a, you know, they'll, they'll phagocytize sometimes and they'll, they'll have to kind of clean up some of the damage also. And these, as you see now, these are macrophages that have now gone out into the tissue. And so you can see the macrophages that, excuse me, the macrophages that are there. Okay, now, Eventually, these macrophages can transform themselves into what we call epithelioid cells. And these epithelioid cells can even um, be further placed along where they start to form multinucleated giant cells. So when we want to look at um, giant cells, we're talking about granulomatous inflammation. And when we're talking about granulomatous inflammation, I want you to remember the rule of threes. And so the first thing is there are three different types of giant cells, but there's also three different types of granulomatous inflammation. So remember the rules of three. So the
The first type of giant cell we call a Langhans type giant cell. What does that do? All right, that's associated with what you think about as a granulomatous inflammation. So that's your standard run-of-the-mill granulomatous inflammation. It has these Langhans-type giant cells. So they're like, shaped like a horseshoe or a circle. And you see the nuclei will line up around the outside. There'll be this common cytoplasm in the middle. And these are what you think of as just regular run-of-the-mill giant cells. And these are what they look like. You've got these cells here around the periphery. So this is what you think of as associated with a run-of-the-mill granulomatous inflammation. All right, how are these different? Uh, these, the, the nuclei aren't arranged in the periphery. They're more mid-periphery, I'd so say. So they're more jumbled here. So they're more jumbled, and we call these foreign body giant cells. And so in the eye, when you usually see these is, if you've had, for example, Someone had a branch, you know, poke them in the orbit or poke them in the eye, you may have this. But the other thing is, is around sutures, you'll get a foreign body giant cell reaction. So when you look at a suture that's inside the eye, you can see a foreign body giant cell reaction. These have the nuclei throughout the cell itself clumped together instead of lining up around the periphery. So they're called the foreign body giant cells. And here you have, believe it or not, this is what's left of a nylon suture here. And here you have a foreign body giant cell sitting around it. So you can even get a foreign body reaction around a suture. And the third type of giant cell, boy, you guys get passes here. Uh, two-ton giant. Two-ton giant cell. And what is a two-ton giant cell? Um, so they have the, like a ring of nuclei, but it's a little more centered. And there's a clear cytoplasm in the middle and then the foamy vacuoles outside. All right, so you see these are round, the nuclei line up, but you see this empty, vacuolated space. And what is that vacuolated space filled with? Digested material? It, it's actually lipid. Oh. Yeah. So when we process tissue, when, um, you know, when my technician processes it, just a normal tissue, and you put it formula and they process it, it goes through several steps, including uh, dehydration steps. And so what happens is during routine tissue processing, lipid dissolves. And so it leaves this little empty, white, foamy looking appearance to it. So when you see these empty white spaces around here, that's actually lipid. So these are the so-called Teuton, T-O-U-T-O-N, Teuton giant cells. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry, I can't resist that. I've got to get some reading glasses. My old department chair, when you were late for lecture, he had these reading glasses at the end of his nose, and he'd peer over them. He'd go, good evening. <laughs> so I've got to get some reading glasses. I can just peer at them and look at you guys. So two-ton giant cells, what are they um, characteristic of? There's a couple things you need to know. Juvenile xanthogranuloma. Juvenile xanthogranuloma. Juvenile xanthogranulomas. You see these in kids. And so these would be kids, they'll have these really weird looking lesions on their iris and they'll get these spontaneous hyphemas. And so you can get them in juvenile xanthogranulomas when you see these. And so Langhans giant cells, foreign body giant cells, Teuton giant cells, three different kinds of giant cells. Now, you've also got three different kinds of, of inflammation involving uh, granulomas. And so, the first type is called sympathetic ophthalmia. What is sympathetic ophthalmia? You got me there. I don't know. Yeah, this is a historical thing, really, hopefully. We don't see this often. So it's when you have an eye that's injured and has that inflammatory response, the other eye, the fellow eye, can also have that same response. So it's thought to be in reaction to some of the uh, pigments and other things like uveal. Uh, antigens that are released after that injury. So people have argued about this for many, many years. You'll get a severe injury and your immune system will get really stimulated and you end up getting an immune reaction even in the other eye. These were especially devastating during the First World War, which ended 100 years ago last month. And people would get these horrible injuries in one eye. And then, you know, two weeks later, the good eye would start to get inflamed and inflamed and eventually they'd lose the good eye so they'd go bilaterally blind from this and so it was sympathetic meaning you'd get a sympathetic reaction in the opposite eye so it's an immune reaction nowadays we have corticosteroids this is why when you have a severely injured eye 
you know, you, you either fix it or remove it within 10 to 14 days. You don't let it sit there forever. Now, again, we can treat sympathetic ophthalmia now. It's really rare. I think I've seen, you know, one or two cases in 30 years now, so it's very rare. But it char it's characterized the diffuse type of granulomatous inflammation. So when you actually see sympathetic ophthalmia, you see this diffuse granulomatous inflammation involving the choroid. Now, what's interesting about this is it tends to spare the chorio capillaris, and that's a way you can differentiate this from other forms of, of um, diffuse granulomatous inflammation. All right, now there's a second type of granulomatous inflammation where you get these focal nodules. What do you think that one would be? What do we call that one? What kind of a granulomatous inflammation do we have around the eye where you get nodules? It's actually sarcoid. So this is actually called sarcoidal. So when you see this kind of a nodular granulomatous inflammation, it's called a sarcoidal inflammation. And what's interesting, look at that giant cell. I mean, that thing is huge. And so you get it's a really big giant cell. And you can get these interesting, they call them asteroid bodies in here. I don't know, some people think that looks like an asteroid. I think it kind of looks like a, I don't know, amoeba or octopus or something, but they call them asteroid bodies. And so the second type of granulomatous inflammation is a nodular type, multi-nodules, and it is called sarcoidal. Now there's a third type where you can get a more zonal granulomatous inflammation. And, and what you think about with the zonal granulomatous inflammation, take a stab there, Rachel. I just thought it was zonal. I didn't know anything was going okay. on. So this is, is if you have a rupture of the lens capsule, or you end up you know, either traumatically or you do a really bad surgery and you leave a lot of cortex in there, you can actually get a zonal inflammatory reaction around it. They used to call this phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis. This is one of the two double misnomers you have to memorize. It's not anaphylactic and it's not infectious, but it, it's a ruptured lens capsule or a lens capsule with, with really, really bad surgery causing a zonal inflammation around it. And here's an example. This was a, a Wyoming rancher who got kicked in the head by his horse, trying to put it in the trailer, and so ended up with this really nasty injury to his globe. This is a ruptured lens. Believe it or not, that's what's left of the cornea. There was a little bit of ciliary body up here, and so you get this zonal granulomatous inflammation around that. So that's three types of giant cells, three types of granulomatous inflammation. Now, we. We don't really have a place to put this in, so I want to put this in um, right here, just for lack of a better place to put it in the lectures. Paish, what's different about this globe? Um, it's disorganized. Disorganized? Um, it is definitely smaller than you would expect. It's in. small. What do you make of the shape? Uh, it's the shape, and it's more uh, like square. Yeah, it's or square or instead of round. How about the thickness of the square? Very thick. Really thick. What do you think this would be? Uh, so, Tysus bulbi, spelled with a P H T H. <laughs> Tysus bulbi. And so, this is an end stage reaction to an eye to either severe inflammation, a severe injury, anything like that. But this is an end stage. And so, once an eye um, shuts down, it becomes tysical. So, the eye becomes smaller, it shrinks, it becomes hypotenuse. The pressure will go down to zero. It's more square than round. The sclera gets real thick. The choroid gets thick. You have disorganization of intraocular contents. So here you can see it. Look at that eye. It's almost square rather than round. Look how thick the sclera is. Look how thick the choroid is. It's spongy and, and very much edematous. And you've got disorganization of intraocular contents. There's the thickened sclera. There's the spongy thickening that you see of the choroid. All right, what is this stuff? Um, so in, in the center, it looks more like calcium, calcified material or bone. Um, All right, let's go closer, and indeed, it's, like bone. it's bone. And so interestingly enough, with end-stage tysis bulbi, you can get bony formation inside the eye. Where do the you know, what cells form bone? The RPD cells. 
RPE, exactly. So RPE is a very pluripotential type of cell. And so when you stimulate it, you know, in any way, it can lay down gliotic tissue, it can even lay down bone. And so in an end-stage tricycle eye, you'll literally see bone inside the eye. So my technician has a heck of a time cutting these. She goes to cut them and literally hits bone. And so I just didn't know where else to put in Tysis bulbi. So we kind of put it in here because it is an end stage of how the eye reacts to either chronic inflammation or chronic trauma. All right, now I want to talk a little bit here. This is where I make my plea to you guys because you guys are going to be in surgery eventually. When we get specimens from the OR, the more information that we have from the surgeon, the better we can treat that specimen. And so communication is the key. And plan ahead of time. You don't know how many times we get a call from the OR. Oh, Dr. So-and-so wants you to do this with the specimen. And we're like, well, wait a minute. It has to be fresh, or it has to be in this special fixative, or it has to be in that. And instead, they just plop it in formalin, or sometimes they don't even call. We get it down in the lab. Do this. Rule out that. That doesn't help us at all, because by then it's often too late. So if you have a special circumstance, or you want a special stain, or you want us to do something different with the specimen, call us ahead of time. And so you call me, call the lab, the fellows are down there. You really got to communicate if you want something done specially. Because if not, if we don't know what you want done, we can't do it for you. So, you know, simple phone call is, is really critical. And I'm telling you guys, because if you're in with Dr. Crandall and he's doing 14 cases in a day, he's not going to have time to do any of this. It's up to you guys. And so, but eventually when you're out in practice and say you decide you're not going to do a fellowship and you're going to go out and practice in Orem, you know, you want to send me a specimen, call and just let us know ahead of time if you want something special. So communication is important. So we get a requisition sheet. You don't know how many times we get a requisition sheet with no history. So how do I know what you want done with it when it says cornea? Okay, cornea, well, I don't know, is it an ulcer? Do you want special stains? Is it a dystrophy? You know, are you looking for an acanth amoeba? I don't know that, so then, my technician process it, then we're looking at the slides and we go, oh, did, was it this, was it that? Then we have to pull out the computer, try to look up the op note or look up the clinic notes. And so if you, um, you know, are gonna be in there, fill out that form, it only takes a sentence. You know, herpes zoster, rule out this, or, you know, this, rule out that. Give us information and fill out the requisition sheet. Now, if you're worried about a tumor somewhere, a drawing is really nice. And so Boopy does these all the time, it's wonderful. He'll put a little drawing, he'll say, he'll say, Nick, you know, chap comes in with this specimen and, and we want to look for this ta booby. And so, you know, you can want to be able to align it so my technician can tell, okay, you're worried about the nasal border, the temporal border, draw a picture. Now, handling of the tissue is important. And again, we don't talk about this very much. If you grab a tissue with a forcep and really crunch it, you crush it. And crush artifact makes it difficult for us to know what the pathology is. And so be very gentle when you're grabbing that tissue. Be very careful. Now, if you've got a potential tumor or something necrotic, don't just submit that. Submit some normal tissue around it so we can look at that also. And that's very helpful to us. Fixate it promptly. I mean, have the nurse put it into the formalin right away. Now, what do we normally fix it with? 10% neutral buffered formalin is good for almost anything. Even if we're doing immunoperoxidase stains nowadays, formalin is, tissue is okay. If you're gonna do EM, now that's really rare that we do EM anymore, but you wanna have a glutaraldehyde based fixative. If you want frozen sections or special stain, for example, to look for lipid, that tissue has to be fresh. And so the important thing is, is when you do fresh tissue, don't just put it in the jar dry, because it'll dry out. Don't drop it in BSS, because it'll get macerated, take a saline soaked gauze, soak the gauze in BSS, put the tissue on the gauze, then put that in the container. Call us immediately. We don't want to let that sit overnight and not be fixed. And we can go ahead and freeze it and fix it, so let us know. If you're out in the community, you can actually take a specimen, put it on the little saline soaked gauze, close it, put it in one of those little um, insulated chests, just put ice in it and it'll keep for 24 hours. You can FedEx it to us.
And so that'll keep it, just regular ice. It doesn't even have to be dry ice. Just regular ice will keep it for 24 hours. Now, conge is different because if you do conjunctiva, you take it off, what does conge do? It curls up in a ball. So if you're looking at a trigium, that's okay. That doesn't matter. But if you're looking at, say, you know, you're worried about pathology in conjunctiva, you don't want it to roll up in a ball. And so the idea is you want to lay it out. And what I found best is, you know when you um, spin your gown around, there's that little piece of cardboard that you've got? The undersurface of that is kind of a rough cardboard. That's perfect to put conj on. And so what you want to do is, is when you spin your gown, take that, cut a little two by two centimeter piece on it, lay the conjunctiva on that little piece of cardboard, let it sit for about a minute, and then float the whole cardboard in formalin. And that'll actually stick to it. And my technician can process the whole specimen while it's laid out like that and um, get the margins. And so the problem is, is, is how do we tell margins? We've had people put pins in them. Pins come out. They don't do anything. Regular ink, you put ink on there, the ink dissolves from the formalin, so that doesn't work either. You can put a suture in the end of a specimen, and that'll help mark it, but the other uh, nice way to do it is put a notch in there. So here's our piece of cardboard. Here's our conch nicely laid out till it sticks. Okay, notch is temporal. Cut a notch in the tissue, in the um, cardboard, in the notch we can mark. Notch is temporal. Two notches are superior. Draw us a picture. Again, 30 seconds to do this, and we can align your specimen exactly and tell you what the margins are. So conch is the way we do this. You know, if you've got eyelid or cheek or something, that's a different matter, and that you can even put in a little suture or something like that. Okay, questions on that? Mm, very good. Okay, I want to talk one last, um, last little part here about stains because we use several different stains in ophthalmology and ophthalmic pathology, and it's important that I think you understand what various stains do. Boy, where did we stop? Probably, <laughs> I think we stopped at you. What's our standard stain? What's the stain we use the most often? Um, this is H&E. And what does H&E stand for? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> well, at least you got H&E. You get credit. So H&E. Hematoxylin. Hematoxylin. Eosin. So the hematoxylin is the blue part of the stain. The eosin is the red part of the stain. So that's just our standard stain. And here we're looking at a cornea. You can see it. It stains the epithelium. It stains inflammatory cells, blood vessels. This is the stain we use, you know, 98% of the time. I mean, just a standard H&E stain. So we do that routinely. Now, there's another stain that we use, probably the second most common. What do you think this stain would be? Um, just an ESN stain? Nope, not quite. Let, look and see what is it staining. So we're looking at the cornea here. Corneal epithelium, look at that little line of magenta staining there. What part of the corneal epithelium is that? Uh, basement membrane. Basement membrane. So what stain stains for basement membranes? Uh, PAS. PAS, exactly. So PAS, again, if you see it written down, you say, what? Uh, periodic acid shift. So that's why we say PAS. It's easier to say. PAS stains basement membranes, that nice, bright magenta color. And so things like epithelial basement membrane, if you want to look at basement membranes, you do a PAS stain, so it's a basement membrane stain. All right, now, there, is, um, there are several stains that we use for um, corneal dystrophies, and, and when we get to the cornea section, we'll memorize the mnemonic to do that, but there's a couple of different stains that we can use that stain different material that can be involved in corneal stromal dystrophies. What do you think this stain would be here, Mike? Oh, is this... Is it Alcyon Blue? This is Alcyon Blue, exactly. And so what does Alcyon Blue stain? Um, I'm trying to run through the mnemonic here. All right, we might as well do the mnemonic now because you guys are just saying, what is he talking about? So for corneal stromal dystrophies, there is a mnemonic to, to memorize. Marilyn Monroe really always gets her man in L.A., California. Okay. Don't ask, but that's the one that's been around since I was a resident, so since the ancient times. All right, so Marilyn, mucopolysaccharide, Monroe, 
I'm sorry, Marilyn macular dystrophy, Monroe mucopolysaccharide, really recessive, A, Alshin blue. All right, so mucopolysaccharide, Alshin blue. So Alshin blue stands for mucopolysaccharide. All right, again, you guys get a pass. Gets. What's that? Ah, good guess, but not quite. Gets is granular. Her. Um, Highland. Highland. Man. Tell me. I mean, you're either one. <laughs> Masson's trichrome. Okay, so this is a trichrome stain. And so granular hyaline, and so it stains hyaline. It's a Masson's trichrome stain, and it stains hyaline. And then last, L? Lattice. Lattice A. Uh, amyloid. amyloid, California. Congo red. Congo red. So amyloid is in lattice dystrophy, and it stains with Congo red. So this is a Congo red stain. Again, it's not really red. I think it's more burnt orange, but that's just me. But not really red. Burnt, kind of longhorns, you know, burnt red, which is longhorns. Okay, so that's amyloid. And what is it? What am I showing here that amyloid that, that does when you do a Congo red stain that looks cool under the microscope? Birefringent. So if you put polarized filters on there, two of them, and you cross them, you get birefringent, and the amyloid lights up on the specimen. It just you know, it looks cool when you do it. So those are, those are some of the stains you do. So memorize that mnemonic for the cornea session. We'll talk a little bit more about each of these. But um, again, this is now most commonly seen in lattice dystrophy. Amyloid is the material. Congo red is the stain. Okay, now, we've, I guess we've come back around. Now, there are other stains we can do. What, what kind of stain is this? Yeah, what's a stain for fungi? Uh, Anybody? GMS. GMS. Okay, so GMS stands for Gamori Methanamine Silver. And so the way you remember that, it kind of stains the, the fungi kind of a silvery black color. And so here you can see the little hyphae. And so GMS is a stain that we we'll use when we're looking for fungi. And again, if you have a corneal ulcer and you're sending us a corneal button, and you're worried about fungal ulcer, put, you know, rule out fungi. And then my tech will know ahead of time, she'll stain it with GMS and we'll look for fungi. Okay, what kind of stain is this, Rachel? So th these are like those cysts that you can look for? Big in cysts in the cornea. What do you think these guys could be? Oh, I was looking for acanthamoeba. Exactly, so this is a stain that stains for acanthamoeba. And again, bonus points for what stain this is. Hard to remember. Anybody? Gridley. Gridley. Okay. And, and I just like this. Gridley, I, I don't know. I, for some reason, I, Gridley sounds like, you know, the butler in an English, you know, TV show. You know, Gridley, bring tea. You know, so, <laughs> yes, sir. Tea. So Gridley stain stains for acanthamoeba. And so it'll stain the cyst, this kind of, again, kind of a silvery, Color, it'll stain the background um, stroma of the cornea green. So that's how you know it was a well done stain. It's a gridly stain. All right, now this is kind of a different stain. Mike, what the heck is this? So this is a Prussian blue stain? Prussian blue stain. And what is Prussian blue stain? Iron. Iron. So it's a specialized iron stain. So here you see a cornea, we've got some iron in the epithelium. So there's a whole bunch of iron lines that form in the cornea. And if we stain them, we can stain them here. And how do we remember Prussian blue and iron? Something to do with the war and being dusty. <laughs> Again, it's 100 years since the First World War ended. All right, so who were the Prussians? The Prussians were the militarists in the eastern part of Germany who really led to the rise of Germany and, and really led to the aggression that eventually became World War I. And so Prussian blue stains iron. Iron makes tanks, makes cannons, makes, you know, shells, so iron. So Prussian blue stains iron, and that's how you remember it. 
All right, boy, this is a, a different one. What's wrong? It's another red stain or Lipids, oil red O. All right, so this is easy to remember because it's called the oil red O. So it stains oil red, and you've got these little O's of oil here. So oil red O, it's easy to remember. Now, what do you have to do special with the tissue to do this stain? It has to be fresh tissue. It has to be fresh, because remember, our standard processing dissolves lipid. And so if you want to do a stain looking for any kind of lipid, then you have to have fresh tissue. We freeze it, we cut it. So this is oil red O. It stains oil red. So these little O's will stain red. So that's how you remember it. Oil red O for lipid. All right, so we're going to go next week. This is a little church. It's very interesting. This is a tiny little church. And again, right off the main uh, pedestrian walkway in Vienna, it is spectacular inside. So we're going to visit that next week. So read the section on um, lid, lid pathology in your BCSC. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about eyelid lesions, you know, start to finish next week. Questions? We have oh, like five minutes. All right, great. So again, that's kind of the, the um, framework for how we're going to do these lectures. And so we're going to look at each area. It'll be lid next week, it's going to be conge the week after that, and then in January again we do cornea, then we'll do intraspecular meshwork glaucoma, lens, IOLs, retina, optic nerve, orbit, tumors. And so that'll be the order. So just look and see next week's lid, so read your BCS. You know, it's really a nice summary in there. It's nicely done, it's not very long. And so just read that over, and that will give you a good background for pathology on lids. Okay, thanks.